thank you both so much for being here. I'm so excited to have you talk about your experiences with your career change and your career transition. It's been years <laughs> since we worked together with Options for Success and just coaching around that PhD to uh, applied job transition. But what I love about that is that you get a chance to tell us and really talk about kind of your experience with shifting from the space you were in to the space you're in now, that kind of headspace you were in and what the challenges were. And so people can see what's on the other side. So to get us started then, um, Aisha, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure, I am Dr. Aisha Russo. I am a former tenure track professor at a Research One institution. And I currently serve as a division director for a governmental entity in Denver, Colorado. That's awesome, Tina. I'm Dr. Tina Zarpour, um, and I am currently the Vice President at the San Diego History Center in San Diego, California. That's awesome. I'm coming to visit you in <laughs> summer and Aisha in winter because I want to <laughs> ski. I want to learn how to get out there and learn how to ski. <laughs> um, so Aisha, as you said, you were a tenure track faculty member when we started working together. Can you tell me a little bit about what frustrations were you facing that really prompted you to want a shift in your career? Yeah, you know, I really enjoy the opportunity to conduct research and teaching. Um, I had a great teaching load. Um, the research that I was doing was was right in line with um, the trajectory that I had set for myself. Um, so I enjoyed it. But um, I really came to a self realization that I had a deep interest in pursuing some other personal and professional opportunities um, that weren't really conducive, as I saw, to staying in the academy. Um, to add to this, I was a newlywed. Uh, I was living in Arizona. My husband was living here in Denver. And we had decided as a family that we would move wherever the best job lead took me. Um, but I certainly was looking at um, career options here in Denver. And while I was having this cathartic, cathartic experience within myself about, man, I really want to pursue some other opportunities professionally and personally, I also realized that I wasn't really hearing um, a lot of open discussions um, from other academics about opportunities outside of the academy. Um, I, I was a member of the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity led by Dr. Carrie Ann Rockamore, and she offered a session specifically about the types of opportunities that could be pursued by individuals with earned doctorates outside of the academy, and it was, it was life-changing for me. Um, it felt like everything had aligned for me to hear um, that session at that at that specific moment in my life. It was, I was like, yeah, that was for me. Um, and from there, I started reaching out and pursuing some of those resources. And that's what led me to be on the tenure track. Mm, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that that was one of the starting points yeah. for your process. I mean, in that, were you doing this kind of on your own or did you know of any faculty friends who were also kind of secretly or quietly no. looking at other options? I didn't know anyone and the one or two friends that I had who I felt like I could trust with the information they had kind of warned me like girl don't be out here saying that um like that we that's that's a no-no uh, we don't kind of openly discuss that stuff and so I almost felt like it, it was weird. I, at, prior to that point, I had not joined Twitter. I really didn't know anything about Twitter. Um, but I found like this underground network on Twitter of people who were talking about leaving the academy. And I was like, oh, these are rebels. Um, but I was intrigued, right? Like I was trying to understand kind of the mentality of like, man, where did they have this mental shift? And, and, and it's okay not to identify myself out here and, and still have a safe space to process what I'm thinking. Um, but no, like I really didn't have people in my immediate life um, that I felt that I could really discuss that I was think uh, outside of people who weren't academics. Um, right. They, they didn't like, just change anyway. What? Get a new job. <laughs> just another job. 
Um, but no, there weren't any other academics who were really like, no, this is, this is a real thing and it's okay if you decide that you don't want to do this, you're not a failure. Mm. What about you, Tina? What stage were you at in your career and where were you feeling stuck? Um, I came to Options for Success, I think it had been mm, within the year of uh, earning my doctorate, um, or maybe even a couple of years, this is where I lose track of time, but between the, the time of sort of getting the PhD and getting the job that I landed and I currently have, um, had been a, a good two years. So in my case, I knew that the academy wasn't for me and that I had not set myself or set, um, set myself up for that or set my sights on having an academic position. I just didn't have a clear understanding of what was next. And I also felt that I had put myself out there in so many different ways in that job search that it had worn me down and felt like I had very little left in, the, in terms of resources. And I mean, there was a lot of, I mean, there, I think there's some shame and failure attached to the idea that you aren't pursuing academia because it's what's counted as success is if you, <laughs> it's like DNA, right? Like DNA is successful. If it replicates itself, and um, I'm not a scientist, by the way, so that's, um, it's, 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 so for, for your, for professors and for your department, they, you're only successful if you, you they are replicated, right? If you're, if you're the mentor replicates you and they, you become them in another place, right? Yeah. Um, but that was never my model, but I didn't have anything else to replace it with, so that was the struggle was to find who I was and, and that identity outside of it and find a good match for my professional life that took into account my life experience and my interest and my, and my academic background as well. It's interesting. You say you were kind of worn down by the process. Why then join this program that's just going to take you through another process? What was it about it or just where you were at the time that made well, you feel like you wanted to try? Sure. It was the job application process when I didn't, I mean, I was do everything is very solo. I mean, you feel like you're on this journey alone and there's nobody to advise you. So, I mean, I didn't have people helping with resumes or, you know, thinking about that thing resumes even differently than I had been thinking about it. Um, and, and thinking about positioning my skills in different ways as well. So there was no sounding board or sounding wall. It was, it was this very solo journey of like putting yourself out there, trying to make contact, sending your stuff out, cover letters and not hearing back or getting rejections or, or, or whatever it may be. So, um, I mean, I think having that social support with the small group setting and then having sort of a guide along the way, that was something for me brand new. Like that's, you know, being kind of the independent person that I am I mean, I don't even go to yoga class. Like I have a hard time <laughs> doing that kind of stuff. So um, it, 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 was, it was like, okay, this isn't working. I got to try something else. Mm. Yeah. So Aisha, for you, why did you choose Options for Success at that critical moment? I mean, you were gathering resources already. Why make the choice for the, this particular program? You know, one of the contacts that I reached out that um, spoke in that session I, I mentioned earlier recommended you and your program. Um, they specifically recommended you. They were just like, just mm. check her stuff out, see what she has. She's doing some wonderful work. And, you know, at that point, I was like, listen, I'm willing to give it a try. Um, you know, I had been, I, I was going into my fourth year. Um, and I kind of felt like it was the time where I needed to make a decision. Yeah. Um, and so I remember having the discussion with my husband and, and, you know, we, we ended up saying, Hey, 
this is either really going to launch you into a place where you want to be, or it'll at least clarify if really what you want is to stay in the academy, but it look a little bit differently. Um, but either way, we, we saw it as a, as a win-win situation. Mm. Yeah. Kudos to your husband, because, you know, for transparency, and we talked about this before, um, you know, we started the recording that when you two were in the program, it was the early stages. Yeah. I mean, early stages of it, like pulling it together and trying to get that idea, like pulling all the tools together so that the job seeker wouldn't have to do it you know, like creating a container for it. So kudos to him for seeing the, the vision alongside you and being able to, to say yes to it, like there will be some value here. Um, so Tina, for you, when you were going through the job search process, I mean, one thing I'll say is, you know, a job search process is not instantaneous, right? That's one thing even you said earlier. Um, what is something that you took away from our work together that helped you when you were in a tight spot or trying to get through the, the job search, whether it was the application process or networking or interviewing or, or some aspect of it? Um, it's, it was, I remember a couple of things very clearly. Um, I, up until we, uh, our latest move, I just moved to a new house back in November. I had the vision board and I, <laughs> and I kept it as a reference point, right? And, um, you know, because I, I am part, partially a visual person, um, but I had never done an exercise like that. I had never treated myself or, or indulged myself in something like that. And, you know, I, through the years, I referred to it. So I kept, I mean, I held onto it for a good five years or, or longer. And it's funny the way those things kind of come around, but not the way that you expected them necessarily. Mm -hmm. So one of them was learning to be a leader. That was like a word, a phrase that I cut out and put on there. And, and surprisingly, that is something that has really come to the fore in, you know, the last, you know, four and a half to five years of my career trajectory. Um, so the vision board and, and the everything resume, like putting, I don't know if those are still tools that you yeah. use, but, but that that ex that sort of forced exercise of putting everything down, right? Mm -hmm. Because so much, even even now, more these days, everything has to be so edited and so scaled down and so to the point and so pithy and succinct. So it goes against everything like that. But it does. But that becomes this this source, kind of a source book for a lot of other stuff to come build from, like whether it's the phrasing that you use in a job interview, whether it's the words that you pick from in the actual resume, um, you know, but, but it's like that reckoning of your, for me, it was the reckoning of the past and present, like where I was in the moment and what I had just finished with the PhD and the job and the things that I had knew that I wanted to do. Um, and then, but my life before, I mean, I was a person, I mean, I was a fully fledged adult before getting my graduate degree. Don't we forget that? Don't we forget <laughs> that? I mean, even when you have a job beforehand, right? Before you've done a, especially a doctorate, more so even than a master's, like we forget. I don't know what it is about the socialization process, the culturalization mm -hmm. process. We forget. Whole exactly. Person. Yeah. Yeah. I was a whole person. <laughs> I, I actually had a career, um, you know, I had several jobs, like, you know, and, and I, I went into the graduate world, um, you know, kind of went off in, in a little bit into the, another direction and, can, you know, can, did that a little bit, but kind of came back to what I, you know, the same field I was doing before, which is the museum field, mm -hmm. but in a different way, mm -hmm. so. And what about for you, Aisha, what's a top takeaway from the program that helped you when you were in the job search process? Mm -hmm. You know, the one-on-one -on -one coaching was priceless for me. Um, I was really in my head about, man, mm -hmm. what does this look like? Um, uh, how is this going to be regarded? Um, I, I was very much in my head. So the one-on-one -on -one sessions were really helpful for me, um, as well as the, um, just the, just the safe space. I can't really reiterate, reiterate that enough. The safe space to be able to say, 
you know, what Tina and I are freely saying here today that we know that you're not a failure if you got this terminal degree, but you're not doing kind of what you've been socialized to do with it afterwards, um, that it's okay to say, I'm not really feeling that. Um, but I was very much stuck in those emotions at that time um, and was in the throes of wrestling with um, how is this going to look? Um, how am I, how do I reinvent myself? Um, and I never felt um, that in engaging with you in the one-on-one -on -one process, I never felt like this lady is, is like, she doesn't have it together, uh, mm -hmm. right? It was like, hey, these are all, I mean, you normalize the experience. Um, we talked about, yeah, these are expected feelings that are coming up. Um, you know, really kind of sit with yourself and identify what it is that you want, not all these other expectations that have been piled upon you. Um, I think that what really appealed to me also was I was working with a woman who had earned her doctoral degree. So I didn't mm -hmm. have to explain a lot of that mm -hmm. stuff to you. You cut right to the heart of, yes, get it. These are the things that you've been socialized to think, yeah. believe, and or move into. You could cut straight, straight, to, the, straight to the heart of that and really began mm -hmm. to um, give me things to process um, and address. Um, to help me quickly get, because I, I was applying for jobs to help, yeah. to help quickly get me into this place uh, where I was like, okay, I'm ready to do this and I'm okay. And you, you were quick. I mean, I remember in the course of the time we worked together, I'm like, wait, you have interviews already? Wait, you are <laughs> like you. And that's, that is also a testament of the energy that you brought to the process. I mean, everybody's job search is different, right? The market is different at different times. The things you need are different at different times. So it's, there's a lot happening, right? But I think I just remember too, you being very, active like you would take it and do something with it and sometimes people need to take it and sit with it and that's fine too right but i just remember you being in that space of okay i'm already making moves out here i'm already trying so let's just put this into play and i remember you like kind of going to conferences as well and managing like still being active as a faculty member and trying these other things on the side and i'm always impressed when people manage to do both because just like you said earlier tina a job search is not easy it takes a lot it takes a good bit of time the networking the writing cover letters the getting all that together let alone just like bringing your courage to it every time despite wow. rejection or you yeah. know no and, feedback and at all <laughs> and that that's the um it's the emotional toll more than the like, you know, I remember people complaining, oh, I got to make a new resume and cover letter each time. I'm like, that's nothing. The hard part is falling in love each time for a position because that is what you have to do. That is the commitment that it takes is each and every time you fall in love with that position because that's the only way you're, you're going to convince somebody else that you need to be in that position. Yeah. And you fall in love, you put yourself out there, it's that vulnerability and then it just doesn't work out sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that's that kind of, I, I talk about where I'm getting worn down. That's what was wearing me down. Mm -hmm. Not the I'm, mechanical typing, you know, type. Of right. Yeah. Right. But yeah. so it's exciting to me now. I mean, we were trying to do the count back to see how many years it's been, but it's been a hand, good handful of years since uh, mm -hmm. you went through the program. And so now tell us about the role that you landed, um, you know, sometime after the program and what's most fulfilling about that role for you? Um, well, as I described, I'm, I'm a vice president of, of a museum, the, um, the San Diego History Center. So it's, it's fulfilling in lots of different ways, but I get to do lots of different things. I mean, I deal with so many um, different topics, um, different stakeholders, different skill sets. I mean, even, I mean, just this week, I'm dealing with issues of intellectual property, you know, as I'm applying for, you know, federal and private grants. Um, uh, I, you know, dealing with, um, um, being able to talk to board of trustees, um, talking about funding, you know, our future. Um, I deal a lot in interpretation and 
um, working with the media and um, storytelling and bringing the past to life. And, and um, I also work with our sense of community because um, part of my philosophy that motivates me is the role of history in our lives and our connectedness to the past and our connectedness to each other. So using history as a tool of civic engagement. So I work with um, all different kinds of groups in San Diego. I have the privilege of working with many different indigenous groups and native groups and um, newcomer groups and um, immigrants. And, um, you know, I did a finished a research project with with some collaborators and uncovered this whole side of um, the history of Black Panthers in San Diego. So, you know, might not into something down the line. And, and it's, it's the, it's come, it's combining a lot of the different skill sets. And it's not about the promotion of self, right? It's not about me becoming, publishing something or getting notoriety. It's, it's really about what we can accomplish together as a, as, um, collaborators within the museum, but within the community as well. And then creating products, like, right, I'm, I'm, I'm writing and um, putting things together in different ways, like images and writing and exhibits and web pages and media projects and putting them out there for people. And it's not about producing, and, and you know, I'm being a little um, exaggerating or facetious, it's not about producing something for peers, right? It's like, it's, it's the opposite of the ivory tower. And that makes it exciting to me because I, my audience is, is everyone, right? Because we have to hustle in the nonprofit world, in the museum world. If you don't make yourself relevant, you know, you're out. So that makes it um, challenging in an exciting way as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. What about for you, Aisha, what did you want to be different in your life or in your career as a result of making a change? And how did your, the role that you secured help you to fulfill some of that? Yeah, you know, I had three main goals. Um, I wanted continued autonomy that I definitely mm -hmm. love about the academy and I didn't want to give give all of that away. Um, so I wanted continued autonomy with an opportunity for growth. Um, I wanted to be able to live with and spend more time with my family. And I wanted an increase in pay. Um, yeah, you know, that's always nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, no one's mad about those. Um, so uh, initially, when I landed the position, um, I was, uh, the, the position was current, was originally the director of an office. Um, I actually will have been in the position five years in July. And um, yeah, so that kind of dates us about how, how long ago we were doing this. Um, we've grown from an office to a division. Um, I'm overseeing a staff that oversees $650 million worth of work. Um, we have you know, established ourselves as um, the go-to agency when folks have um, questions related to um, specific topics. Um, I, I described myself the other day to someone as both an advocate and an educator within government. And I know that people tend to not think that those people really exist in government, but we really do. Um, and so it's just been a wonderful opportunity. All three of those things were fulfilled. Um, I live with, uh, I, I mean, I, I joke about it when I first uh, moved here. I was like, yeah, like, go figure. I live with my husband. Like, what a novel, what a novel thing. Um, like, I live with my husband. Um, I love it here. Um, we're able to see each other on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to a every other week or uh, every two-week basis. Um, I have uh, continue, continued autonomy for sure um, and an ability to grow the division uh, again from an office to a division and even beyond um, in ways that um, are encouraged. Um, and there was an increase in pay. So uh, nice. I always say those farmers market trips aren't cheap. Eating well does not is not always uh, on the cost effective side. Like pay increases are nice; they help. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so then, maybe to just round us out, what would you say to the grad student or PhD who is kind of sitting on the fence right now? They're not sure if the professoriate is really for them 
but they're maybe a little bit nervous about even just exploring and trying to figure out what they might do next. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Tina, I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> um, I would say that it doesn't hurt to, to consider other things and to start exploring them in a way that's, that's still safe. You know, part of what makes um, the academy and wanting to be in that world, sort of the professorial world, um, even more kind of, um, I don't want to use the word dangerous, but it feels like if you don't do everything perfectly <laughs> in a certain um, set way of, pat you know, and patterns and that it could just not work out. And to me, that just feels, that feels more of a risk, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, what you were saying, Aisha, about my gosh, I can see my husband every day. Well, that was always, I, that wasn't ever, you know, that was always a requirement for me that I needed to be with my husband. We needed to live in the same geographic space. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it, this other route would have asked for and demanded so much of me on a personal level that I wasn't willing to do that. Right. I mean, I already had children. Mm -hmm. um, I had my daughter during the, during getting a PhD and I was pregnant with my son um, as I was doing my qualifying exams. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I didn't have any, well, we weren't close to family back East. Um, you know, I, I was the care and I, you know, couldn't afford daycare. Right? So it needed to fit into my life. And um, so I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't have any safe words of like, okay, it's going to be okay because you don't know, like, you know, like, Right. But I, I, I feel like it's a lot safer to not choose that route for me. Right. That, that, that's what I would say. That to go down that route seems like it's, it's putting a lot at stake. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have always been a little bit of a rebel and that I've always wanted to live my life as a whole person and never wanted to, to just be about one thing. And this, I've been able to do that. I've accomplished that. So yeah. I don't know if that was what you were looking for. No, I just, I, I didn't, I mean, it wasn't something I'd initially thought about, but I'm like, you two have such the experience of being able to look back, you know, and not be in the throes of even, quite frankly, should I take a class about figuring this out? If I, because I think there's a lot of fear. I hear um, the, well, I'm interested, but I'm, I'm graduating in a year. So should I take the class now or should I wait till later? And I'm like, well, if you're graduating in a year and you don't know what your prospects are for a job, don't you want to have some options as a, you know, so you don't just have one way of thinking about what your opportunities are, mm -hmm. especially in the current landscape of funding for graduate students and lack of funding. And so yeah. I, I guess I just kind of selfishly wanted to ask, is it okay to start earlier rather than later? <laughs> That's really what I, oh, is I, it safe to start, you know, earlier yeah. rather than later? Well, You're, and yeah, no, I, th I think it's, it's much better. And I, I, you know, that seed was planted in by myself and I kind of pat myself mm -hmm. on the back Yeah, because I knew, I, I mean, I saw the writing on the wall, like it, it, in our field. And I think we both share the same field, if I remember correctly. Anthropology. Anthropology. It, mm -hmm. It's, there's not a lot of jobs. There's not a lot of um, tenure track jobs out there. So I saw the writing on the wall and could very easily just sort of do a cost benefit analysis of like, okay, this isn't going to be it. Um, and, and also because of my, my master's degree was not, was a terminal master's, it was in, in the applied field. Okay. So my, that already had opened up my world to like, oh, yeah, I could put this to work in all of these different scenarios and all of these different situations, but I'm going to get the PhD because I really love the topic mm -hmm. and I really mm -hmm. love the content essentially. So, yeah. Any final thoughts for us, Aisha? Something you might say to the PhD who's sitting on the fence, not sure if they should try finding other options for themselves, even if they don't choose it, but looking for it? Yeah. You know, one of the phrases that I use in 
a myriad of areas of my life is options are the spice of life. Mm -hmm. It is better to have options than not to have them. You can mm -hmm. choose what is better than that. Good gracious. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that coupled with invest in yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You've already invested to go forward with the doctoral degree. Why not just make an additional investment in yourself so you have these options and you can choose? Mm -hmm. I think that the information um, from the program is so rich that even if somebody decides in the end, I really want to stay within the academy, that there are tools and principles and processes that they can apply in uh, being an academic and maybe doing something on the side maybe having mm -hmm. developing their own business or their own company on the side um, or figuring out how they want to channel some of those things directly mm -hmm. into doing something creative at the university. To me, it's a win-win situation. Um, it's, yeah, it's just that it's a win-win situation that um, particularly a lot, of, a lot of us that go on to pursue doctoral degrees identify ourselves as lifelong learners. Why wouldn't you give yourself the opportunity con to continue to learn and grow and develop? Um, and in that, uh, you, might, uh, you might leave the academy or you might not ever go into the academy. Um, but if you do, you've learned new information and, it's, and that's okay too. Mm. Thank you both so much. It's so much fun to talk to you and it's so much fun to hear the amazing things that you're doing right now. I almost feel like I want to like take field trip and like shadow you at work because I need to see, <laughs> I need to see like that boss side at work <laughs> because you two are doing amazing things. But I, I'm so sure that your stories are going to be an inspiration for others. And I thank you so much for just your time today and sharing it with me. Thank you. Thank you so much.